Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my honor to be able to present my work with you, uh, in front of you today. And I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity, especially my dear friend, Sir Magdi Yacoub. Uh, it's also my pleasure to attend this meeting because I've learned a lot already in just one day. Heart valve biology and uh, tissue engineering, as you will see, is not my area of expertise. Rather, I'm a synthetic polymer chemist who specializes in designing uh, polymer materials for applications, including medical applications. And I've, um, I'm going to describe three examples of polymer-based technologies to you today, where each is based upon natural products as the monomeric units that are used to build up these polymer technologies. So the three parts will include, first, the use of quinic acid for the construction of engineering materials, followed by uh, polymer nanoparticles that are designed for chemotherapy, not chemotherapeutic, sorry, um, uh, antimicrobial-based uh, delivery. We're also using them for chemotherapeutic delivery, but I'm going to focus only on the antimicrobial <laughs> delivery today. And those are more recently being constructed from glucose as the natural product. And finally, I'll finish with hydrogel materials that are being uh, produced by advanced synthetic methodologies that accelerate uh, the polymerization chemistry to produce the polypeptide materials that then uh, form the basis of the, of the hydrogels. So you can see that neither of these, uh, none of these uh, three technologies is based on hard valves, but I will promise that I will uh, finally uh, wrap up the discussion with some ideas that were generated from, again, discussions that I had heard uh, yesterday. So uh, overall, the theme, again, is the use of natural products as the building blocks to construct these polymer materials. And our interest in this area was originally based upon uh, an interest in sustainability and, and using monomers that are uh, re renewable resources, uh, conducting polymerizations to produce polymer materials that could have functional uh, performance. And then uh, ultimately, whether those polymers are designed to undergo degradation or not, they will undergo some degree of degradation, just as uh, polycarbonate materials uh, that you use in drinking glasses and used to be present in baby bottles weren't designed to undergo degradation. But when they were placed into uh, dishwashers, they did undergo some degradation and produce a bisphenol A, which is the monomer building block that constructed the, the polycarbonate materials, uh, which has some potential uh, biological side effects that are adverse. So ultimately, what we want to have happen, whether, again, the materials are designed to degrade or not, that when they do degrade, they would um, return back to the renewable resource, the natural product monomers from which they were derived, and that those degradation products then might have uh, um, positive biological uh, effects and or environmental resorption. Okay, so again, the three topics are going to start uh, first with the engineering polymers uh, derived from quinic acid as the natural product. Uh, our interest in this uh, particular uh, technology actually started in, in uh, the desire to produce materials that could be used for bone repair. So in orthopedic applications, and in, in particular uh, large bone uh, repair, uh, often metals are used, and there are several problems with metals. There's a mechanical property mismatch, and the metals don't break down, so it's a permanent implantation. In the use of uh, degradable polymer materials for uh, orthopedic applications, typically these are aliphatic polyesters, and they have uh, insufficient mechanical properties and also break down into hydroxy acids, which are inflammatory and can cause uh, adverse responses. So we turn to nature to look at what nature's building material is, and, and the most uh, predominant building material is cellulose, and it's based upon uh, a polymer of, of glucose, and these 1,4 beta uh, linkages uh, along the backbone allow for good chain-chain packing that then uh, provides for crystallization within uh, the bulk samples and intermolecular and intramolecular hydrogen bonding, which uh, allows for the Young's modulus to approach at least the same order of magnitude of that of bone. The problem with using uh, cellulose uh, in, in orthopedic applications is that uh, the glycosidic linkages uh, 
here are not uh, hydrolytically degradable without cellulase enzymes, and humans don't uh, possess those enzymes. So our strategy was simply to um, use uh, cellulose as a model polymer material and replace these glycosidic linkages along the backbone with something that could be uh, readily hydrolyzed. And so we chose to install a carbonyls uh, along the backbone that then generates this carbonate uh, uh, linkage between the glucose monomer repeat units so that uh, good mechanical properties would be expected. And upon hydrolytic degradation, the byproducts would be simply glucose and carbon dioxide, uh, each of which is um, bioresorbable. So our strategy in a retrosynthetic analysis was to, uh, to take this designed polymer and recognize that if we could produce a monomer where three of the five hydroxyl groups were protected, then two uh, hydroxyl groups would be open for the polymerization followed by deprotection, and we could get to that from glucose. Now, this strategy is still being pursued, but in the meantime, a postdoctoral associate who was quite uh, talented recognized that this monomer uh, from quinic acid could be uh, produced in, in a very simple, uh, straightforward synthetic route, and that its polymerization followed by deprotection would lead to a polycarbonate uh, backbone, which would be uh, hydrolytically degradable, that also contains these bicyclic uh, rings along the backbone, so it should have reasonable mechanical properties. And this monomer, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is derived from quinic acid through just a couple of um, chemical reactions. So since quinic acid has growth promoting properties and it's a chiral starting material for pharmaceuticals, we had anticipated that it would be readily available and an interesting molecule to build into a polymer structure. So she went ahead uh, and pursued this uh, route. And again, from quinic acid uh, through simple lactonization, tying up this lactone ring and satellating, uh, the satellation occurs in, uh, in both of the positions uh, four and five. So she obtained a mixture of regioisomers. Those could be separated from one another. Each could be polymerized independently to produce two regioisomeric polymers, one where the polycarbonate is through the one, four positions and one where the polycarbonate linkages are through the one and five. She then pursued a deprotection of these polymers and characterized their physical uh, properties. And although they were found to be uh, thermally stable up to reasonably high temperatures, which, for instance, could allow for uh, uh, purification of, of implant materials uh, and also uh, sustained a, a high glass transition temperature so they wouldn't undergo any kind of um, uh, softening during, during that process. Uh, in fact, the glass transition temperature is higher than that of bisphenol A polycarbonate that I'd already um, mentioned has um, adverse effects. And so we thought that these materials were, were quite promising. The challenge with them is that they're um, quite expensive to produce, in fact, and the, the key challenge is in this deprotection. Uh, you can see here that uh, the R group is never fully a hydroxyl group. She could not obtain, obtain a full removal of the silo protecting group without uh, breaking down the backbone of the polymer. So we wanted to pursue a uh, more economical uh, and straightforward strategy to produce materials out of quinic acid. So uh, Lauren Link, a PhD student, together with Alex, another PhD student in my group, and Keith Heron, a PhD student in biomedical engineering, pursued a strategy where quinic acid uh, would be tied up into the, into the lactone uh, to remove one hydroxyl and the carboxylic acid, leaving open three hydroxyl groups. And then they did a reaction with allyl chloroformate to install these allyl functionalities. The thing about the carbon-carbon uh, double bonds of these allyl groups is that they can undergo what's called a thiolene reaction with uh, thiols. And this is uh, photochemically triggered. So by using a, a number of multifunctional thiols together with this trifunctional uh, allyl, uh, allyl carbonate form of quinic acid, uh, a series of cross-linked networks could be produced. So the functionality here is three, the functionality here is two or more, and this, the, each of these is then a, a cross-linked network, which is produced after the monomers are pre uh, fabricated into a desired form uh, upon, uh, again, irradiation. 
So these uh, materials, uh, depending on the, the thiols that were used, have different uh, physical and mechanical properties. And these have been studied. I'm only showing a, a series of dynamic mechanical analysis traces that illustrate uh, significant differences between the polymers as a function of the uh, multifunctional thiol that's used uh, during the cross-linking. And what you can see is that the glass transition temperature uh, varies from about physiological temperature to nearly 100 degrees uh, Celsius. And the crosslink density uh, also uh, is varied as a function of the crosslinker, which is related to the toughness of the materials. So we feel like these materials are uh, ready for um, uh, potential biomedical applications. Uh, maybe in bone repair, but, but maybe uh, as cartilage replacements or just um, glamour implants or, or something. Uh, so we wanted to take a look at uh, the hydrolytic degradation. And this was studied over a series of uh, several weeks. Uh, and in a, a shaker, um, in incubating shaker uh, at 37 degrees at neutral pH. And what you can see is that the uh, amount of swelling uh, is basically zero until uh, about um, three months, and then the swelling uh, takes off. At the same time, the, the mass of the sample is maintained until about the same period of time, and then you can see the degradation of the material. So these materials are exciting for their um, long-term implantation uh, in, an in an application that might be uh, something uh, on the order of the time scale needed for uh, bone, bones to heal. If we turn to the uh, second topic, which is the antimicrobial nanoparticles for in infectious disease treatment, uh, this is a, quite a different uh, application. Um, here, uh, we're looking toward the ability to depot uh, antimicrobial agents into an organ where there's an infectious uh, uh, infection uh, occurring. And uh, the two target organs are uh, the lung and the urinary tract. And uh, we're doing this work in collaboration uh, with Carolyn Cannon at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and also uh, David Hunstad at Washington University uh, School of Medicine uh, for uh, lung and urinary tract infections, uh, respectively. And I just want to show you uh, one particular uh, system that, that we've been exploring. And this is a nanoparticle that's derived not from natural products because we wanted this particle to be stable and remain intact throughout the entire uh, analysis so that we could understand how the particle behaves uh, with the antimicrobial agents uh, loaded. So this polymer is uh, based upon acrylic acid and styrene. So polyacrylic acid you find in uh, diapers. It's um, hydrophilic. It swells to a great extent in water. Uh, in fact, it's water-soluble if it's not cross-linked. And uh, polystyrene is found in styrofoam cups. So these are commodity materials. They're not very interesting. But when they're tethered together in this block copolymer structure, where the hydrophilic portion is connected to the water-insoluble hydrophobic portion, and these are then placed into an aqueous solution, they assemble into multimolecular um, aggregates, which are micelles. And the assembly of these micelles is reversible, so they can be assembled and disassembled depending upon the conditions. Uh, what we do in my laboratory, what we've specialized in for about 20 years now, is then conducting cross-linking selectively throughout the shell of those particles to lock the assembly into, into, into um, a stable structure. These cross-links not only lock it into a stable structure, they also gate the uptake and release of guest molecules into and out of the core. And most recently, we found that there's a difference in immunotoxicity of the particles where the micelles are more immunotoxic than are the uh, shell crossing nanoparticles. So these are exciting nanoparticles for development. We can control the size. We can control the shape. Typically, we produce these on the order of about 10 to 30 nanometers uh, in diameter, so about the size of a large uh, protein or a small virus. 
Um, what the uh, antimicrobial agent that we've been investigating uh, is uh, silver. Uh, silver is a broad-based antimicrobial agent that does not uh, develop, uh, to which uh, organisms do not develop resistance uh, easily. And we've got two different types of silver loaded into this particle. In one case, a silver cation is interacting electrostatically with carboxylates of the polyacrylic acid in the shell. And in the other case, a silver carbene complex, which is hydrophobic, migrates into the hydrophobic uh, core of the particles. And the silver cations in the shell and the silver carbene complexes in the core can be uh, observed by transmission electron uh, microscopy. So these particles then were uh, tested for their um, in vitro efficacy in inhibiting bacterial growth against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also E. coli and also in vivo. And all I'm showing uh, right now are the um, in vivo data, uh, or some of the in vivo data, uh, that were collected in mice that had been inoculated into their lungs with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And those mice uh, then are uh, placed into each individually into a tube with their nose exposed, and those tubes are placed into a box, uh, which is a nebulization chamber, and then this allows for nebulization of uh, the antimicrobial solutions for treatment. The mice then inhale, uh, obviously, the, the um, environment. Okay, so when, uh, when these mice uh, were then uh, monitored for percent survival as a function of time, you can see when they received a sham treatment, they all uh, died within two days. Uh, however, if they were uh, treated with tobramycin, which is clinically ap uh, applied, uh, they all could survive. And when they were given silver carbene complexes, just as a small molecule in solution, uh, dosing uh, five uh, times with, um, let me total up the dose, uh, about three milligrams per, uh, per, uh, per two times daily uh, doses, five doses total, it's about 14 milligrams of silver to uh, achieve 60% uh, survival for the animals. We had anticipated that the packaging of these silver uh, complexes into the nanoparticles would uh, redirect the pharmacokinetics and reduce the amount of silver uh, required, and that's in fact what was found. So when the uh, silver carbene complexes were packaged into what's called a shell crosslink kinetolite uh, nanoparticle, uh, we found that for 60% survival we needed only uh, less than one milligram of silver. And uh, so this is a 16-fold less silver concentration required when the silver is packaged in the nanoparticle versus being free. So again, the reason for the, for the um, decreased dose we had believed would be uh, due to a redirection of the pharmacokinetics. And uh, that was uh, investigated not with the initial uh, non-degradable system, but rather with a degradable, uh, more advanced uh, polymer that was assembled into similar kinds of particles. We were interested in this degradable material, obviously, for the fact that it could ultimately break down and, and clear uh, from the body, but also because the, the chemistry is slightly different here. So in addition to having this polyphosphoester backbone, which is uh, similar to DNA or RNA, uh, we have uh, a side chain substituents, not only carboxylates for electrostatic interactions, but also thioether groups for interactions with the silver. And we find that this uh, silver binding interaction is much tighter, so that the um, solutions of the particles loaded with silver are much more stable, even when challenged with sodium chloride, whereas silver chloride will precipitate from uh, these uh, silver loaded particles. The polymer concentrations could also be much higher, so overall we could obtain higher uh, silver concentrations for uh, administration. These, uh, sam these samples, as I mentioned, were, were uh, uh, um, studied for their, for their pharmacokinetics and biodistribution, and this was done by uh, using silver 111 and tracking the silver 111. Uh, and what was found is that when the silver 111 was loaded into uh, two different kinds of these degradable nanoparticles versus being a small uh, molecule alone, there was substantially uh, higher injected dose per gram uh, retained in the lung, uh, not only at one hour, but out to uh, 48 hours. So it's, um, again, uh, fitting with the hypothesis. Now, these materials are, are uh, as I said, quite, quite exciting, uh, but there is a, a potential drawback. 
Um, we have uh, studied the degradation of these materials. We've also looked at the, uh, the um, interaction of these um, particles with, with cells uh, and interactions of the degradation products with, with cells. And what's interesting is that we've found that uh, one particular degradation product actually uh, knocks down inducible nitric oxide synthase. And so that's a, a, an interesting finding. However, we are still concerned about some of the degradation products, including the ethylene glycol, which uh, is a toxic molecule. So this brings us uh, back to natural products again and using those for building up these nanoparticles uh, in order to uh, avoid uh, potentially uh, harmful degradation products. And that brings us back now to the, the glucose uh, example, which I had almost started with. Um, and instead of uh, building up polymers of glucose by the condensation chemistry, the protection of condensation chemistry I had illustrated schematically, instead, uh, Kuichiro Mikami has uh, built up a cyclic carbonate monomer where the one, two, and three positions are, uh, sorry, one, two, and three positions are protected, and the four and six positions are tied up into the cyclic carbonate. And this then can be used for ring opening polymerization, which is a controlled polymerization, where we start with an initiator. That initiator ends up at the alpha chain end. The, the ring opening propagates uh, by attacking monomer after monomer until finally we end up with uh, uh, an omega chain terminus, which can be quenched by uh, protonation. So we can control uh, the degree of polymerization by uh, controlling the stoichiometry of the initiator versus the monomer. So if we have 100 to 1, then the average degree of polymerization is 100. If we have 10 to 1, the average degree of polymerization is 10. So we can control the chain length while maintaining a narrow um, uh, chain length distribution. In addition, by looking at these uh, polymers by uh, mass spectrometry, uh, we find that uh, the chain ends are, in fact, the uh, initiated and terminated chain ends, which means it, it is this controlled polymerization. And what that does is it allows for uh, us to grow block copolymers, which then <laughs> allows us to build up nanoparticles based on these uh, polymers. So in one example, uh, we've produced a polymer of the phosphoester backbone and then chain extended uh, the glucose repeat unit. So we have the functionality of the phosphoester uh, polymer and we also have the biocompatibility of the uh, glucose uh, repeat units. Uh, and what's also interesting here is that the alkyne functionality can undergo not a thiolene reaction but rather thiolene reactions. So we can bring in various um, thiol groups having either positively charged functionalities, negatively charged, or zwitterionic, and install those uh, cationic, anionic, and zwitterionic functionalities onto a block segment of the, of the polymer, which then allows us to put that into the shell of a micelle and the shell of a, a cross-linked nanoparticle. So these are being uh, further pursued uh, as well. We turn finally to the, to the last topic for the last about five minutes that I have. Um, this is the um, functionalized polypeptide gels. And then, as I said, I'll, I'll try to tie this all together and relate it to uh, heart valves. Um, uh, we're, many people are interested in, in peptides because of their uh, ability to um, have a bio, biological um, a cue, uh, and, and also because of their ability to undergo uh, supramolecular interactions in order to uh, build up uh, well-defined uh, structures. Uh, from the chemical standpoint, if we start with a cyclic uh, N-carboxy anhydride uh, monomer, we can control the um, primary uh, structure of the polymers. So being whether they're being linear, uh, cyclic, whether they're blocky, uh, whether they're um, branched or, or brush-like. And then we can also uh, control the composition, whatever R is, so that we can uh, control how those polymers then assemble. And in my laboratory, we've been looking at uh, micellar assembly into nanoparticles, but also organogel and hydrogels. And I'm only going to focus on, on the hydrogels uh, today. OK, so I, I told you that we've um, advanced the synthetic methodology to uh, accelerate the production of these polypeptides. And it uses old chemistry, these N-carboxy anhydrides, which I had noted were, were um, <coughs> described uh, more than 100 years ago. 
But what we found is that uh, the typical route to uh, ring opening of the n carboxyan hydrides forms this carbamic acid uh, initially, and the carbamic acid uh, can be uh, deprotonated, and there's an equilibrium between uh, the uh, carboxylated and carbamic acid forms of the amine chain terminus, which then uh, slow the propagation because only the free amine can undergo attack on another monomer. So what we've done is a very simple thing, and it, it happened because our glove box was, was down for, for a couple of weeks. And so the students uh, conducted the, the um, ring opening polymerization on a Schlenk line uh, using a nitrogen flow. And what they found is the nitrogen flow actually carries away the carbon dioxide, so it's just Le Chatelier's principle. And we drive the equilibrium toward the uh, free amine, which then can attack another monomer and ultimately lead to a fra fast propagation. So you see if we have a, a high nitrogen flow, we have fast propagation. If we have a slow nitrogen flow, we have slower propagation. If we have no nitrogen flow, we have even slower propagation. So this allows us to produce these polymers in a matter of, of hours rather than uh, days. And we can also control uh, the molecular weight and the molecular weight distribution. Now what we had um, been doing was following some, some literature and using a polyethylene oxide uh, terminated with an amine as the initiator to make block copolymers in, in a single step. And we found that in fact those uh, solutions uh, gelled uh, in dimethylformamide, which was a solvent. So these are our organo uh, gelators. And if we instead use a, a bifunctional polyethylene glycol having uh, amino uh, termini, then that grows the uh, polypeptide from each end of the chain. And depending on the chain, uh, the, the lengths of each of the, the blocks, we can uh, produce uh, hydrogel materials, uh, even at, at relatively low uh, weight percent loading. So the um, gel uh, to sol transition is reversible. We can sonicate to produce a, a solution and then heat it back up and allow it to uh, repair itself to reform uh, the gel. By transmission electron microscopy, you see the gel has these long fiber structures, whereas the sol has those fibers uh, broken down uh, by the sonication process. We've also looked at the uh, degradation of these uh, polypeptides. Uh, under action of, of various enzymes, and you can see that enzym enzymes accelerate uh, the uh, degradation of the materials. And finally, as promised, I'll, I'll try to bring this all together, um, and that is that um, I told you about three different natural product monomers that are being used to produce polymers that uh, are designed for particular functions. Again, not related to heart valves yet. Um, however, uh, based upon the fact that we can produce uh, engineering types of rigid materials, nanoparticles that can carry uh, therapeutics, and also hydrogel materials, and based upon the, the presentation uh, that Jane gave yesterday, where she had indicated that the heart valve structure has a rigid shell and flexible core, and that hydrogels have promise uh, in uh, heart valve tissue engineering, uh, but many challenges, and I didn't have her lovely uh, structure, but this is meant to be her cross-section of, of the, the heart valve leaflet. Um, uh, one could imagine that uh, the rigid material could be used as an encasement, which also allows for photo curing and patterning, as, as Jane was describing, uh, while the uh, hydrogel materials uh, could be uh, the uh, soft uh, central material, and they could not only provide for the, the, the mechanical integrity, but also uh, incorporate biochemical cues. And finally, uh, nanoparticles could be loaded within that uh, domain uh, to carry uh, maybe growth promoting or, or therapeutic agents. So um, yeah, it's, so, it's <laughs> something that needs a lot more thought, and, and I look forward to more of your presentations to give me more ideas. Um, Anyway, I finally uh, would acknowledge uh, everyone who contributed to this work. I tried to point out uh, most of the people throughout the presentation. I do also have to thank the National Science Foundation, the NIH, and the Welch Foundation for support of this work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Woolley. So if there are any questions from the audience, we have time for a couple of questions. If they are known, then I will ask a very broad uh, question okay. related to your talk. Um, have you 
tried or do you look for any of these materials that you synthesize? Uh, what is the cellular reactivity or do they behave when cells are sitting on them or uh, if cells can actually react with the material? Yeah, yeah. So um, most of what we've been doing uh, has been the nanoparticle-based work. And then it's a solution of nanoparticles that is, pl that is incubated together with the cells. And we look for cytotoxicity, cell viability. And we also look at uh, cell internalization of, of the particles. Only just recently, we've, we've um, obtained a, an osteoblast cell line, and we're starting to look at the osteoblast interaction on the, um, the more bulk uh, quinic acid-based materials. So that's, that's work that is progressing forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you.